All right. That worked out really well. Hello. Uh, welcome to Refresh DC. This is the first one of these we've done in a while, and uh, it's pretty exciting to have everybody here. So Woo! Thank you. I like the enthusiasm. It was nice. Uh, yeah, so if this is by chance your first time at Refresh, uh, welcome. It's good to have you here. Uh, sorry? Who are you? Oh, all right. I'm Jason Garber, or whatever that's worth. Uh, but anyway, uh, Refresh, as you may or may not know, it's a group for web designers, developers, what have you, people like us that are interested in learning new and fantastic things. So it's great that you're all here. It all means you're pretty passionate about what you do and are interested in learning. So thank you for making it here. Um, yeah, that's really all I got to say. So uh, Justin will introduce our speaker, sponsors, and all that fancy stuff. So thank you. Uh, no. Um, thanks for coming out, guys. Um, we have a couple of really amazing sponsors. We have Living Social, who sponsored the food. Raise your hand if you're from Living Social. Yeah. 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 So, you want to say anything? Um, <laughs> they're, they're looking to hire a lot of smart people. We're looking to hire a lot of smart people, but they're also looking to hire a lot of smart people. So, if you want to go work at Living Social, find Doug, he's wearing yellow. Um, <laughs> And thank you to them for the pizza. Also, thank you to Molly Fool for giving us this great space to do this in. Yay. Anyone from Molly Fool? Yay. 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 Reunion. What's that? Homecoming. Home. Yes. If you will. Re refresh. <coughs> well, didn't start, but like was one. Yeah, we had well, yeah early early on in refresh. The uh, the guys at Molly Fool were incredibly gracious and let us uh, let us use their space at the other building for the better part of a year and a half, I guess, and that really really helped us out so we're pretty excited to be back here so thank you Kevin, Greg, Doug, everybody else that uh, helped put this together so thank you guys. I remember when three and a half years ago when it was like 20 people and yeah. like then it became 150 <coughs> all within Molly Fool. it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, but to introduce our speaker we have Jim Lane he's the director of user experience at ClearSpring. Um, uh, long time AOLer, revolutioner, Netscaper, um, Smart guy, awesome. He's going to talk about some of the unique and interesting challenges that we've had with Addis and how we've faced them to see a, a really tiny button make a really huge impact on the world. Great. Take it away, Jim. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, right. everybody. Uh, okay. Um, fantastic. So, uh, before I get started, um, I'm going to uh, go off my notes here. So, if I'm looking down here and up a lot, uh, I haven't memorized this completely, so that's why. Uh, so my name is Jim Lane. Uh, my presentation uh, tonight is about the Atlas platform, and I'm hoping to share some insights about how we've designed Atlas to grow and reach a really huge audience. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about design, UI, some product stuff, some metric stuff, some testing stuff. Um, so lots of good stuff. Before I got started, though, I did want to say, um, even though I'm standing up here, I'm going to be representing the work of a lot of folks, some of which are here tonight. Um, so I just want the Really appreciate the chance to kind of show their work and uh, represent the uh, the whole group. So, good to them. Uh, oh, and uh, when I put this together, I wanted to come up with some sort of kind of fun theme for it or something. Um, I'm a big movie fan, so I decided to go kind of with a movie theme. So, add this. It's on for one billion people. Uh, it's in space, no one can hear you shit. Uh, so, uh, so tonight I'll be talking about uh, some of that stuff about design and UI mostly, but also a bunch about testing, which I'm, I'm really excited to uh, talk about. Oh, cool. Hey. Even better. Awesome. Uh, cool. I have, I have height. Thank you. This guy's awesome, by the way. He's in the for us. Cool. All right. So let's get started. Um, so first things first, uh, what is Addis? So Addis is a tool um, that uh, people can put on their website. You might have seen this little orange plus on a web page that lets you share to Facebook, Twitter, uh, a bunch of other destinations. Um, the, uh, let's see. Um, the mission basically is to help publishers make sharing easy uh, for all people that come to their site. Um, the, uh, when visitors want to share content, uh, the code then we provide a excuse me, this. Um, the code on the page provides a button and a menu that a person can then use to share to a little over 300 destinations. 
So I wanted to start tonight just kind of taking a look at where we've come in the last couple years. So Avis was founded in 2006 by Don Bonnerberg and acquired by ClearSpring in 2008. Um, and so when we started working on it back in 2008, uh, we supported about 50 services, 17 languages, uh, 116,000 domains, and we served about 300 million views a day. Um, in the last two years, we've had a chance to grow those numbers a little bit. So today we support 308 services, 66 languages, 7.2 million domains, and we serve about 2 billion views a day. Um, and we currently see about 1 billion unique users. So that makes up about 90% of domestic internet users about 88% of international users, so global. So tonight I wanted to touch on five strategies that we've used to both design and develop Advis to grow quickly and scale quickly. Because um, so those numbers, that happened over about a year and a half. So the five I want to talk about were first of all designing the product to grow quickly. Um, I want to talk about being dangerously open, giving a shout out to Joel Pulley who's sitting here in the second one. Um, being data informed, building to scale, and then embracing customers, which is near and dear to my heart. So first of all, uh, designing for growth. First and foremost, we wanted to put publishers first because publishers are essentially our customers. They're the people that, that we take care of. Um, obviously, end users are really important to us because end users are our publishers' customers. Um, but the publishers are ultimately the ones that put our code on their pages. So one of the ways that we want to take care of them is what uh, I'm going to call being a chameleon. Brand and visual look and feel is really important to us, but at the same time, we're asking you know, thousands and thousands of publishers to put our code <coughs> and our experience on their pages. And even though, you know, obviously, we care a lot about brand, publishers care a lot about the look and feel of their sites. So as we designed and developed Advis, one of the things we tried to do was make it highly customizable so that you can make it look like a button, you can make it look like icons, you have a ton of control, either via um, simple changes to code or even using a client API to make sharing look pretty much however you like. In fact, this example over here, Pee Wee Herman, uh, uh, that's actually a Flash site, so that menu's uh, rendered completely in Flash. On the end user side, our goal was basically to try to make sharing as simple and effortless as possible. So one of the ways that we did that was by optimizing what you saw to share. So when someone hovers over a menu, a button, or in this case it's a counter, um, the first thing you're going to see is a set of services that you can share to. So what we want to do is optimize, first of all, those services to make sure that the ones you saw were the best possible ones for you to see. So in this case, we optimize not just by popularity, but also by language. So if someone's using a browser that's a different locale, Italian, Portuguese, French, German, uh, they might see a slightly different mix of services based on the popularity of those particular services for people to speak that particular language. So optimizing that was one way we kind of helped end users out. And then the other is personalization. So we pass them to personalize the menu as we go. So you'll see over here is the first uh, nine services are bolded. Those are ones I, I like to use. So as I use them, we service them to the top, we bold them, and that will show up for any add this menu that that particular user sees on their computer. So it's just a really, really easy way to make sharing effortless. So these two strategies have helped us grow <coughs> add this really quickly across a lot of users in a lot of languages and countries. So next I want to talk a little bit about design. Um, we have a, a relatively small design team. There's myself, Jeff Wong, who's our awesome creative director, Foo, CSS Guru, and then we work with a, a bunch of developers who are just awesome uh, JavaScript developers, backend developers. But it's a relatively small team, and that's something that's helped us as well, is have a small team that can move really fast and iterate really quickly um, in, a, in an agile framework. Um, we, uh, a tool that we use, which you can see it from there, um, we switched from the Adobe suite to OmniGraffle, which we found was a tool that worked really well for us to be able to move quickly with really complex multi-page designs and layouts. Um, and so that tool is really, really well for us, and it's also really grid-friendly. Um, I'm not going to get too much into grids, but if you've seen any presentations on grids, if you've never seen uh, like 960GS, definitely check it out. It's an awesome resource. Um, 
but that tool and using grids and those kinds of um, uh, strategies have helped us design really fast. So what we'll usually do is we'll concept ahead of time and then sprint within the product team's agile kind of framework that we've set up. Um, and that's just as an organizational strategy, a way for us to move really quickly. Um, oh, and one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, one of the great things about moving like that and being able to iterate quickly was uh, being able to not only succeed but also fail really fast. So Jared Spool gave a talk a little while back, and it, one of the things he said stuck with me was with the design team, um, if you haven't celebrated a major design failure in the last several weeks, then you know, you're not taking risks. It's really important to celebrate major failures because that means that you're taking risks, you're learning, you're failing, changing, moving on. Uh, which I thought was a pretty cool, a pretty cool point he made. Um, so early on, as we started working on Add This, we knew we were going to be developing a lot of features and a lot of things that we needed Add This to do, and we wanted to do so really quickly. So we started by developing a style and a brand, and kind of revisiting it and looking at it as to how should this work. Um, so we put together a group um, composed of a design group, and uh, our CEO, Human, was there, and some others. Uh, and the idea was just to really think about what did we want this experience to be like? Um, how did we want it to feel for users and have feel for publishers? And uh, so these are some of the words that we came up with and did it kind of like a tag cloud. Um, and then took those ideas and then came up with a visual palette and a style guide that we could then apply to a lot of features and a lot of products. The idea was to take the time to do that up front and then that's it. Do it once and stick to it. And, and it's a simple idea, but having that style to fall back on allowed us to move really quickly. So just for a point of reference, um, this is the original homepage when we first started working on Add This back in uh, early 2008. Um, and then several have uh, been applying that, and there's been several versions since. Uh, this is the homepage as it appears today. And I'll talk a little bit more actually about this process uh, in a few minutes. So um, the next strategy I want to talk about was being dangerously open which is a, a phrase we like to, we like to refer to. Um, and what it, what it basically means is embracing open standards, um, taking risks, and um, really embracing open source, ways to kind of put yourself out there, take risks, measure, learn from it, um, and move on. So for instance, as an example, I was just mentioning on the homepage, we have this process for getting at this. Um, the vast majority of people that get at this to their site come through this process. They come to our homepage, they click on one of our menus, a little logo in the corner, they land here, and, uh, and basically it's a one-click experience. Originally, you had to register to get the code. And it occurred to us, well, what if you didn't have to register? What if you just could click right through and choose whether you wanted to register or not? Well, we knew that was going to be a big hit, right? We knew we would get a lot less registrations. Um, so we decided to measure it. And so we ran a test to see what would happen if a certain number of people came through and didn't have to register. And what we found was is that, indeed, fewer people registered, but there was a solid percentage of people that still chose to register, even if we didn't require it. But for everybody else, the number of conversions, the number of people who got at this for their site, exploded. And at the time, literally, the decision was it was more important to us to be on more sites and more pages. And so that decision made a lot of sense and still does. So a certain percentage of people come through the site, we measure it, Google Analytics, via goals, um, we know what that percentage is, we monitor it, but for a great number of people, they come, they get the code, they put it on their site, their users can share, they're perfectly happy. Um, and again, that's allowed us to grow really, really fast. The main lesson isn't so much don't show registration, but rather, if we hadn't had the tools to do that test and measure that, we really wouldn't have had the wouldn't have had the information to make that informed decision, which allowed us to say, look, we're going to take a risk here. We're going to do something, and we know exactly what's going to happen when we do it. So that was, that was an important takeaway for us to understand. Uh, another open, kind of dangerously open thing. Um, ClearSpring's original platform launch pad, which some of you may be familiar with, um, we've, we've recently uh, transitioned. The, Translation for that menu uh, was done through a translation service. So it was a big old spreadsheet that had all the words and phrases in the interface. We worked through a translation company. We exchanged the file back and forth, um, translated into all these languages. It was laborious. It was really expensive. And anytime you changed something, it was a real pain in the ass. 
for Advis, we already had 17 languages to start with, and we wanted to really grow. We, we, we knew we wanted to go for the long tail, other countries, go for the world. And so what we did was is we designed, an interf uh, we designed a, a language database that basically said, translate it for us. We opened it up to the world and said, you tell us what languages you want to see and, and give us the translations for it. We provided a list of strings, 25, 30 strings or so that make up our interface. Um, people have submitted languages, they've submitted partial languages, partial translations, complete translations. Um, we currently support 66 languages. Um, when we get a translation, we do a bit of spot checking with Google Translate to make sure no one's like, you know, something's not the great translations. Um, do some simple verification. If it's a new language, we create a, a new button for that language. Um, and that's it. The platform does the rest of the work. And that's allowed us to scale those translations incredibly quickly. People really argue a lot, though, like in Russian and they're, they're constantly telling us, no, this translation, no, that translation, no, this translation. But it's worth it. Um, and it's allowed us to scale really quickly. So this has been a, this has been a huge success. <coughs> Similarly, we wanted a way to scale the services we support. So we support uh, these destinations, 308 destinations. Um, and some people say, well, why do you need 300 destinations? Who uses 300 destinations? And, and the truth is, no one does. No one uses 300 themselves. But sharing is different all over the world. Facebook is not the number one service in some countries. Um, right now, actually, in uh, Brazil is my favorite example. Orchid rules Brazil. Facebook's not even second, it's third. Twitter's second. Um, and so, you know, we've discovered that, well, tell us what services you want to see. So we created a directory with a simple form saying, you give us a certain piece of information. Um, tell us the URL and the picture and so on and so forth and we'll add your service to add this. And again, that allowed us to scale from 50 languages to over 300 really quickly. Now the trick there was that even though we put some things in place to you know, try to weed out submissions that weren't like legitimate submissions and so on, we got a huge influx of services, especially because we were promoting it in our menu. Um, and so a little bit later, moving forward about a year, um, our team was, uh, part of developing the OEXchange open protocol um, for sharing, um, another kind of open uh, initiative that we were part of and kind of led. Um, and once this was in place, we could basically say, okay, any new service submissions have to be OEXchange compliant, um, which formalized that process a little more. It's a little harder to submit a service because it has to be OEXchange compliant, but it was formatted in such a way that it made integration a lot easier. So there was two lessons here. One was um, absolutely, we can grow a lot faster, open things up and let, and let your audience grow your service with you. Um, but in this case, putting a barrier in place was actually a good thing. That when quality was more important than quantity, it was good to basically say, no, it has to be more structured, it needs to follow this particular system. Um, and that saved us a lot of work as well, because we were getting, <laughs> just in those, we were getting a huge influx of service submissions. So that was a really good thing for us. Um, so, this is the part I'm really excited about. Uh, next strategy I want to talk about was about being data informed. Um, and this started off saying data driven, and we were talking a lot about it and realized data driven gets thrown around a lot. Um, our, our goal really is to be data informed. We, we see an incredible amount of data, uh, and it's really the best design tool we've got. As a, as a product designer, to have a huge amount of data is awesome. Um, but ultimately, it, it has to inform decisions. You ultimately have to decide this is what the data says, what am I going to do with that? Um, but we have tons and tons of data. Um, let's see. The one point I wanted to make was that ClearSpring, uh, we weren't always as data informed. Um, and as we started working on Addis, we realized we have an incredible opportunity to use all of this data and structure this service really around how it performs, measure and test and iterate. Um, and so this is something that's evolved over the years. We've been working on it. And the really cool thing was is that it was, uh, and to the credit of our, of our leaders, it was really a decision from the top down to say, no, this is how we're going to work. We're going to measure everything. We're going to test everything. And that's going to help guide how we develop and design these products, um, which is really empowering for the team. So, thanks, man. Um, so as a designer, though, this is an awesome opportunity. This is an example of some of the data that we capture. We capture qualitative data, quantitative data, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the kinds of things that we capture and then also how we use it uh, for product design. And I wanted to share the results of some of the research that we've done. So, 
um, surveys. Let's start really simple. Um, we use SurveyMonkey. Um, we do, uh, we're still running a longitudinal survey um, that helps us kind of keep track over time how our brand is doing with our publishers. How do you feel about ads? Is? Would you recommend it to another publisher and so on? And then we also use surveys for specific services, specific releases. Um, and this helps us give some qualitative information um, to help us you know, inform decisions. Uh, so that's a great tool that you can use. Um, for user testing, some of you may have heard of these guys. This is an awesome tool. Um, it's not free, but it's pretty cheap. That's called usertesting.com. Um, it's a crowdsourced user testing service. So if you have a test that you want to do, um, you can uh, write up the tasks you want a user to do. You can write the questions you want them to answer. It takes like, if you know what you want to test, maybe five, ten minutes. Um, submit it, and I kid you not, within half an hour, you can have a video. You're, you're watching somebody test your product. Um, it's really cool, and it's 40 bucks a person. So you literally, for, for 120 bucks, uh, in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you can have use three people using your product and giving you direct feedback, which is really incredibly invaluable. So this is a neat tool. Um, I highly recommend checking it out. And uh, so, um, so Google Analytics, um, everyone here probably knows about. Um, there's a part of Google Analytics, which is really cool, called Google Website Optimizer, which we've used for A-B testing um, and multi-cell testing. So in this case, uh, we were doing a test for our toolbar download page. Um, we currently have a Firefox toolbar in Mozilla's directory. And um, we thought, well, I wonder if we did our own page, um, would we do better if we made our own page and didn't use Mozilla? So first we did a test on four different download pages. Uh, we diverted a certain amount of traffic to each one, and because we see a huge amount of traffic, we say, oh, sure, 5% uh, of traffic for two days. There you go. Um, and tested four of them. This was the winner, with 32% uh, increase in conversion rate. And then we did a second test to say, okay, well, let's, let's take a certain percentage of traffic, send it here, and the rest goes to Mozilla, and let's see how we do. And it turns out what was interesting was that even though this had a higher conversion rate, when you took the traffic into account, kind of broke even, it just wasn't worth it. And because we were, we have a fairly high position in, in Mozilla's directory, um, we said, okay, great. And we were able to do that test in a couple days. Um, so free tool, test results, couple days, get the results, make a decision, move on. Um, so it, there's some really awesome tools like this out there that you can use, and regardless of the scale of your product, it can really help you move quickly. So the next part, so this, um, I want to talk a little bit about our own internal analytics system. We have um, a lot of metrics that we measure ourselves using internal systems, and I wanted to share a couple of tests that we've done. Um, so uh, we get asked sometimes, why do you guys show your menu when you hover over a button instead of when you click on it? And we get that a lot. Um, and ultimately the answer is, well, it increases sharing four times. Um, and we measured that, and we know that number. So for publishers, that makes them really happy, right? They're getting four times as much sharing. Um, but it's also a really great example of where publisher interests and end user interests could conceivably kind of clash, right? Because the publishers are like, hey, yeah, I get more shares, but then the end users, yeah, but every time I hover over it, it shows itself. So what we did instead was say, okay, first of all, let's make it the publisher's choice. You can turn it off if you don't, want, if you don't like the hover behavior. But also, let's take it a step further and <coughs> let's measure what's the distance that you mouse out before the menu goes away. Um, and what's the delay time? So you can find that right combination of where it feels like it feels responsive, um, but I'm not, so if I hover over this quickly, it won't actually present itself. There has to be a certain amount of time before the menu actually appears. So by tweaking those knobs a little bit, we could also kind of offset some of the issue with user experience. So it's like finding that balance between taking care of the publisher, but also trying to take care of the end user. So that was kind of an interesting little dance we did. Um, and then finally, I also wanted to mention the, uh, this is the original Add This button. It's been around for a number of years now. Um, we found that when we introduced what we call toolboxes, these little icons, uh, we wondered, well, is that going to increase sharing? And indeed, it, it, it doubled it, essentially, the click-through rate to sharing. And if you take these icons and make them twice as big, they're 16 by 16 or 32 by 32, you double sharing again. So one of the things we learned was that people see these, there's a lot of equity in seeing Facebook and Twitter. People recognize those and appear to, appear to want to share more when they see them. 
as opposed to seeing the button in the menu. So that was an important thing. And ultimately, what ended up happening back on that home page where you pick what you want, uh, which combination of button or toolbox you want, we ultimately said we're going to change the default option. We don't, this is no longer a default option, but now this is because it's a higher, it's better for publishers. And ultimately, we want to take care of them first. This was a cool test. This is our menu at the time. Uh, two columns, 12 slots. Last slot is the more control. The more opens up a, a longer list of the whole 300 main <coughs> services. Um, this is the optimized and personalized list. And we said, well, well, let's understand, actually, for each one of these positions in the menu, does it affect sharing? I mean, <coughs> should we order it top to bottom, or should it be in a different order? Um, so one of the tests we were able to run was to take a service like Facebook or Twitter and run it across every permutation of the menu and measure sharing and say, well, what is, what, let's see what happens. And as it turns out, it's not really surprising, the top left slot is the most powerful slot for sharing. There's a, you know, a slight increase in sharing. We actually also found the bottom left slot um, had an effect as well. The others weren't statistically significant. Um, so what we did with that was is that we currently order popularity top to bottom, but if personalization hasn't kicked in yet, we'll put Twitter down here, just for publishers. Gives them just a little bit extra boost in sharing. Um, once personalization kicks in, everything's where it ought to be, everything's in the right order, works exactly how you'd expect it to, but it's just, a, just again, just a way to take care of publishers just a little bit more. Um, and again, if, if we hadn't been able to do this kind of multi-cell test, we never would have known that we could do that. So it was a really cool experiment. Uh, I also want to touch on design a little bit. Um, we play with bigger fonts, blue links, uh, giving out the little shadow thing, um, and even this kind of dark background, the kind of like, you know, Depeche Mode thing. Um, uh, and measure those. As it turns out, sales one, two, and three, about 8% click through, increase in click through rate. Uh, the dark background actually was almost 11, but again, data informed. Yeah, it performs better, but it also, well, it's Depeche Mode, right? Um, it's dark, it's not a chameleon, right? Publisher's not gonna want something that jumps up on their pages and looks completely different than their site. And so we said, you know what, we're gonna go with, we ultimately went with the drop shadow uh, because it actually helped the usability of the overall menu as well. Um, and that was the, the control. So that was kind of a cool test. So, building to scale in Star Wars. Um, the, uh, as we've grown, uh, we've, we've grown quite a bit. You know, we're, we're serving up two billion views a day um, with one billion unique users. So as we've grown really quickly, there's certain challenges that presents that we've had to kind of deal with. Um, some of these are more technical. I'm just going to kind of glance over them. There's a bunch of people in this room that will be more than happy to talk to you about some of this stuff. So grab one of them. But let's mention a few of them. So uh, we utilize a content distribution uh, network. We switched um, to Akamai in, I think it was 2008 or 9, I forget, uh, 2009, the, uh, which got us um, improved uh, performance, reliability. Um, that was an important move for us because at the kind of scale we're talking about, um, that, was, that was important. Um, one thing I, I was told I should mention was with the CDN, uh, that uh, we use a combination of permanent caching of elements, and then we have a bootstrapping technique we use to load short-term cached elements. So the point there being that um, just having a CDN isn't so much the point as much as making sure that you're utilizing it in a way that it's actually you know, working for you and optimizing your performance. Then there's the code and the images. So obviously we're serving up this code and this image a lot. So we utilize uh, Yahoo's UE uh, JS compressor to make sure the code is as small as possible and scrunched down. Uh, and then there's this cool thing over here. This is our master sprite. Um, this is, <coughs> it keeps going up and down on DNA. Uh, it's got all 308 icons. Um, and so the idea being that we load this once, we cache it, and then we can just use JavaScript to manipulate it and present the services where they need to be so we're not loading these little icons <coughs> over and over and over again. What's cool is, one of our engineers figured out a script to write that ordered the icons in the sprite in such a way that they were optimized for image compression. <coughs> so the order actually matters that these are in, um, which is like you know, 1K or 2K or a couple K savings. But again, at the scale of 
billions, one, two K actually matters a lot. So that was kind of cool. That was a really awesome thing he did. So is yeah. being tall and skinny part of that optimization? I'm not sure, but I can set you up with someone who can answer that after that. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming it has something to do with the way that they're using JavaScript to manipulate it, but um, great question. Um, and then, oh, I should also mention really quickly um, tech support and QA. So not to be taken lightly, right? If you're going to grow all these publishers and have all these people asking questions, it's really important to be able to scale that. So we leaned heavily on our forums. We have a, we have a, a forum set up on the site. Um, we wanted to make sure we funneled as much traffic there as possible. So as we grew this audience, we could not only have all that contact someplace that's searchable where people could kind of help each other, um, but it was also uh, a way to kind of manage it not being email because that would have just been a nightmare to try to manage a scale. Um, QA-wise, we have a matrix of, um, of, uh, of machines that we use for uh, all different kinds of browser configurations and browser and operating systems. Um, yeah. So, uh, so I'm a UX guy, right? So, uh, embracing so this is incredibly important. And I've already talked a little bit about how with publishers, um, we have awesome outreach. Uh, Justin Thorpe will help put this together, um, and uh, Corey, who's our what's the new title? I forget the new title. Happiness guru. Happiness guru. This is Corey. Um, uh, or reaching out, we're talking to uh, with our technical support guys, talking to our publishers, talking to end users, um, and, and really like finding out what they want, what what's working for them, um, helping work through problems that they're having. Um, I can't I cannot stress enough how important that is. Um, using uh, not just the forums, but also using Facebook and Twitter and using those channels as outreach, not just marketing, um, can help a ton. Uh, let's see. So. Uh, So I talked a little bit about forums already and social media. Um, we also uh, we use we we'll also reach out to our publishers and developers also for beta testing. So if we're having a new platform, a new feature, um, we'll we'll uh, reach out to them to help us test, um, get their feedback, and again it helps us iterate quickly and develop uh, new stuff faster. Um, so that's been really successful for us as well. So. <laughs> so uh, so as we've grown, we've learned some uh, really, really awesome lessons. Um, design to go fast, not just the not just the work that you're designing, but also the process, the people processes behind it, um, and design to scale quickly. Um, the idea of being dangerously open, take risks, and and open up, trust your audience to help you um, become part of building and developing your product. Um, and make sure those cycles are in place to manage that feedback loop. Um, be, don't just be data driven, but be data informed. Um, and whatever you find, there's so many awesome tools out there. Uh, just always be measuring, always be testing as much as you can, because it'll help you iterate quickly and fail fast. Go to the scale I mentioned, and then just learn to love your customers. And the last one, can't forget to mention, uh, don't forget to have fun, uh, which is a good time. Uh, We've got, uh, I brought a couple in here. The uh, Wii has been dominating our game room. Um, I missed a SmackDown the other night. Um, Who won? Not me. Not you. Uh, I missed that. I think we're going to the beard growing contest. This is pictures from our beard growing contest last year. Um, and the latest thing has been, we've got all these radio controlled helicopters, which is awesome. There's one that nearly took my head off today at lunch. Uh, I swear, I think it's freaking dangerous. Uh, it's awesome. And uh, <laughs> no, it was, one of those, it was one of the long ones that has like the six different rotors, and uh, it was um, so I had one more thing. I uh, so uh, I thought it would be fun before I before I wrap up. I wanted to share uh, some numbers. We've been talking a lot about growing fast um, and, and numbers, so I thought uh, I'm going to wrap up with a couple numbers. Um, that have grown while we've been talking. So I, I timed the talk. I don't know how I did, but I timed it like about 30 minutes, roughly. Um, I might have gone a little fast. But uh, so let's look at 30 minutes. So in 30 minutes, 160 publishers got Add This and put it on their site. 400 Brazilians used Add This to share to Orchid. So it was kind of fun. Um, 18,000 people used Add This to share to Facebook, 
And this, this was the last one, this one blew my mind. Um, Addis was viewed roughly 43.7 million times in the last 30 minutes. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of the stuff I've talked about tonight will help you grow your product and your business um, fast. And um, I want to thank all the thank all the organizers for having me here tonight, for all you for listening, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any of your questions. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, great presentation. I was specifically fascinated by uh, the hover over analysis that you're doing. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit more detail about how many second or milliseconds you see is a intent to share so that you should hop over that. Or you know, hop out, whatever you want to call it. <sighs> wow, that's a good question. This was about a year ago. Um, the We tested, it was about, you put it like a quarter and a half second, I think, of cells or something like that. Um, it's it's a really it's a really short interval, but when it was instantaneous, the problem was is that people were mousing around the screen and saying, "Oh, I want to read that," because because we don't know where publishers will put the button. You know, and you have the standard F scan. You know, on the page, if they put the button over here, right in the top left, someone's scanning down the navigation or down the page, they're going to hit it. So by putting just a little bit of a delay, but, but less than a, you know, less than a second, it's way too much. I think it was ended up around a half. Uh, was just enough so that if Theoretically, I've I've paused just long enough to indicate that I want to interact. Yeah, similar to tooltip time. Okay. Similar to tooltip time. You wait for tooltip, and then you pop up. Anybody <laughs> okay. else? One question, really? Sure. Yeah, on your uh, data and form slide, I noticed that some of the newer widgets have the uh, this has been shared X number of times. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, so obviously, you see a lot of counters, right? The Facebook counters, Twitter counters, um, and, and the idea was is that well, uh, we'd like to do is we'd be able to say, well, how many times has this been shared? It might be Facebook, it might be Twitter, it might be Orchid, it might be you know whatever uh, whatever service the person shared to. Um, and so, uh, but it, you know, so having the number there kind of draws someone's attention, and it's also slightly larger <coughs> forms, especially if you use the vertical um, version of it. There's a horizontal one that has the number to the right, and then a vertical version that has it in a box above. Um, and so, combination of there being a button, got a bit more information, plus it's a larger affordance, um, that again almost double the share rate. But those are really preliminary numbers, so um, it's a little early to say, but the early numbers are. It's, it's, it's really successful. It's not really surprising. I mean, people want, you know, it, it's interesting, right? There's also then, if, if five people have shared this or 50 people have shared this, then I might feel a little bit more compelled to share it too because, oh, I want to be part of the cool crowd. You know. Yes? So, um, I, I know you didn't say much about it, but so, so how do you guys, um, I guess, how do you guys make money? <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're, they're, uh, we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt on that question. Um, it's, it's, uh, um, we, the, the Atlas platform is, uh, we, on publisher sites, um, we see a certain amount of data as people, um, utilize the site when they come there, when they search, um, there's a certain amount of information that, um, we see as non-personal identifying information, um, but then there's a certain business, uh, data business around that, so that it's basically, it's nothing really terribly secret. I'm just, yeah, it's not my side of the business, so I try not to talk out of school, but generally speaking, that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. So how do you convince publishers to use this versus just simply putting, like, a, a Facebook like button on their page or a Twitter button on their page? Like, why, why would they use you versus, you know, just putting a couple different buttons on their page? Um, well, the, the idea is, is that we are trying to give publishers a, um, uh, an experience that's more efficient, but also give them access to... Uh, a, a lot more of the world that, that people really do want to share to a lot of places other than Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so had this helps them helps them do that. Um, and also we, we a lot of the customization options, a lot of we don't have a lot of control over a Facebook or a Twitter thing. I, I put it there and it's gonna look how it's gonna look. I don't have a lot of control over it. And um, so if I want analytics. And you know, and analytics. So sorry. Uh, and uh, and then also this uh, having access to the data. 
non-design related question. I'm wondering if yeah. you have done any analysis as to, for the various services you can share to, that average extra reach that a publisher may get. Is Facebook or is a Facebook share, depending on your average size of your network, worth four page views? Is Twitter worth two? Is Orchid worth 18? Because it's really it's worth really, I don't know, right? Have you ever mm -hmm. done that analysis? Yep. Um, and uh, uh, so, so we, we know when we look at our services, um, certain services are um, kind of like black holes, if you will. Uh, you know, bookmarking, right? Um, printing. Printing is our number four service. 7% um, of all of our interactions. Um, it's never going to bring anybody back to your site, right? So um, great. People like to do it. I mean, it shows how much people just like to share kind of spontaneously. Um, but services like Facebook and Twitter are going to drive a lot back. Twitter drives a lot of traffic back. Facebook drives a lot back. Um, Facebook, from what I've seen, Facebook drives a lot because there's a little bit more persistence. The Twitter feed goes so fast that after the after even like a minute or two, it's gone. So it's it's harder to generate as many um, if you have a heavy kind of a heavy stream, if you will. Um, the, uh, there's also some services that are like the smaller, lesser known long tail services that have actually huge, huge drive back potential, but their numbers are so small that it's like, oh look, they drove, they drove back, you know, 50% over the total number of shares, but it's a thousand shares. So, you know, for the for the for the couple thousand people that use that service, they're fantastic, which is why personalization is so important. Because We've seen in our Numbers are, you know, yeah. Are, are you talking about referred traffic or what? So if we place a share button, if it's going to make Facebook more prominent or Twitter more prominent or at this in general, Facebook is going to drive three times more traffic back to that original location than, say, Twitter or Facebook. And I think it's due to the persistence of the stream of Facebook yeah. compared to, to half my system. Yeah. Twitter, literally. Twitter. 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 Well, that's, that's where you're yeah, such a small yeah. community, but the, you know, yeah. the reason for this. That's a relatively small one, but, yeah. but very dutiful. I mean, they, they generate an incredible number of clicks. Um, yes? It, it seems like you guys have this great window into essentially the entire social graph. Have you ever thought about leveraging that into your own <laughs> service? I mean, not, not become another, like, another Facebook, but <coughs> Sounds like a fantastic idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, of course. I mean, um, you know, it, 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 obviously there's just there's there's just a ton. There's there's a lot of different possibilities. You know, and it's still rel I mean, relatively speaking, it's it's we're still relatively early in this journey. You know, we've been doing this for about a year and a half. We've seen an incredible amount of growth. And there's yeah, there's an enormous potential. So it's really exciting. It's a very cool platform to work on because obviously you can tell there's lots of opportunities that have opened open up. Yes. The mind boggles. Yes. Word of the day is privacy. Yeah. Like, in terms of like concerns, since you guys are more of a sharing tool, mm -hmm. how much is that? How much do you worry about the analytical side, like sharing that data? Uh, how do you determine whether it's something you should share with the, with a client or with a user as opposed to something you shouldn't share? Uh, so let's see. A couple different couple different ways we come at that. Um, one is any anything that we see or that we store is is, is non-person identifying. So we, we aggregate kind of general information about um, what people are, might be interested in based on kind of behavioral um, facets like views and, and searches. Um, the uh, we we never share uh, you know, for instance for our email uh, email service um, you know we, we never we don't store and share their email addresses. We wouldn't <coughs> share those with anybody. Um, so privacy is huge. Privacy is really, really important. It's something that we've um, put a ton of work on in the, in, over the last two years because, I mean, obviously, people are trusting us. Publishers are tr trusting us to put our tool on their site. Users are trusting us um, when we share their stuff. Um, and so um, we are really, really careful about um, maintaining that privacy. I'll add just a little bit. Go for um, it. We are a member of NAI. We have um, an opt-out page for any, any cookies that we use for customization or other things. Opt out, we'll never write another cookie to you. Um, very transparent. Uh, what we use the data for page that's that's pretty prominent on the site. So um, we're, as, we're as open as we possibly can. And again, what Jim yep. says, we, 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 we obey all of the storage criteria for any information that needs even non PII. We you know, obey all the storage, storage duration criteria for that as well. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we re reworked all of our privacy toss, um, all of that stuff, restructured all of that because it's it's incredibly important. And, and a lot of people here, I'm sure, are aware. There's there's been a lot of discussion about that, a lot of uh, things in the news about it. So it's something that is really important to us. Um, any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Could be here all night. This is <coughs> this pizza. the worst one asked. What, what keeps you awake at night? What do you worry about? What keeps us awake at night? Um, I, I think one of, you know, uh, I'd say probably one of the most interesting parts about sharing is is that it's um, it's everywhere, right? I mean, it's in browsers, it's on pages, it's in apps, it's, um, you know, this, you know, it, uh, I, I, what we do, I think, is, is, is very technically sophisticated, but, but ultimately, people are sharing all the heck over the place. And so um, I think that's something that's, that's really an uh, interesting challenge to kind of say is, is where is sharing going? With how is it evolving? Um, how are browsers evolving? Uh, a lot of people, this is a space a lot of people are, are interested in. So I, I'd say that there's a, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's also really cool because it's a space that's moving really, really quickly. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there to pivot. Um, any other questions? Sure. I have a question. Facebook sharing and native Twitter sharing. Have you guys done any kind of test uh, to find out what kind of effect the function of Facebook has on users? Uh, users actually using the ad list sharing feature? Uh, I don't know if we've even done a specific test around test around it. Um, <coughs> we, what we did do was is we, we did immediately add them to the platform so that our publishers who ha did have us on their pages could add um, add those buttons. Um, Twitter Twitter was uh, reached out to us when they released their tweet button. They wanted us to be part of that kind of launch campaign. Um, and so uh, obviously there's a lot of interest in those and so you know we in turn wanted to make sure that our publishers had those tools um, at their disposal. Um, we haven't done a lot of specific testing around it. Um, it's just we have just haven't gotten to it, but um, that would be interesting. For sure we will. Next. Yes? Just a technical question. Um, so if the user's on site A and on site B, are you able to, I mean, you don't have to know who that person is necessarily, but are you able to identify that that was the same user? Is that done through cookies because your job is to have like a time frame or, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, okay. Anyway, that's it. There you go. <laughs> sure. I, I, I brought a team to make sure I can deal with as many possible questions as possible. Dylan, uh, along the lines Congratulations, of, uh, thank you. <laughs> you should come up um, along the lines of being patiently open, uh, are there plans to open the stream of sharing? So if somebody like myself wants to write a tool that takes that data and I want to predict the next election based on sharing, uh, could I do something like that? Where is the data behind uh, the firewall and no one has access? Um, the uh, is that stream is, I don't believe, currently in place, um, right? It's not currently in place, but um, I, mean, I can't speak to exactly what would be out there, but it's certainly, I would take them in the possibility. Um, yes, any other questions? Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks Fantastic. so much, Jim. That's fine. That's great. Let's get Thanks again, Jim. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Uh, I know I was, uh, even though I work on the product, um, I was very informed as well uh, and entertained. Uh, um, so, logistics for tonight. We have a happy hour. It's at the Carlisle Hub. Uh, Kevin is downstairs. You don't have to leave the building, Kevin. Uh, you can leave the building. Perfect. I'm sure there'll be a, a, a big herd of people that will all move in that direction um, to, to spend time and drink and network and talk and have a good time. Um, so there's that. Um, hopefully you, as many of you will stay as humanly possible because I know it's fun to meet everyone. Um, secondly, um, and uh, Molly Fool, Kevin asked if, if you are sitting in a foldable chair, there's blue carts in the back. Um, Put, fold the chair, put it up there. Um, other logistics. Next month, I know we're having a happy hour, I believe. Um, we're going to go back to the third Thursday of the month. That's kind of when Refresh GC traditionally was.